morning we pick up our study in the Belgic Confession of Faith, now moving along to the 31st uh, article, no, 30th article. Uh, on the government of the church, we've been making our way through this uh, ancient Reformed Confession uh, penned by Guido de Bray in the mid-1500s. It was a personal document which was adopted by the Dutch Reformed churches. Uh, we do not have it as our particular uh, statement of faith. Uh, however, uh, we, we are very sympathetic, of course, to uh, as indicated here in these chapters. So we will see something of the Dutch Reformed approach to things here in the government of the church in this particular uh, chapter as we read along through it. So let's hear what we have to say. We believe that this true church must be governed according to the scriptural order which our Lord has taught us in his word. There should be ministers or pastors to preach the word of God and to administer the sacraments. There should also be elders and deacons who, together with the pastors, form the council of the church. By these means, they preserve the true religion. They see to it that the true doctrine takes its course, that evil men are disciplined in a spiritual way and are restrained, and also that the poor and all the afflicted are helped and comforted according to their need. By these means, everything will be done well and in good order when faithful men are chosen in agreement with the rule that the apostles gave to Timothy. <clears throat> We've considered the nature of the true church, that uh, assembly of God's elect, whereby they are marked by the true preaching of the word of God, the right celebration of sacraments, and the proper exercise of church discipline. Uh, these elements of the true church uh, are part of the organic life of the church, but they require a certain structure and institution and organism, an organization rather, that will uh, make, make sure that the gospel is indeed preached faithfully, that sacraments are served faithfully and discipline is properly exercised. And so within scripture, we find that there is a government given to the church. Now, in our modern age, there's a great resistance to people being in authority over us, and we uh, want to all be equal and the same. Uh, however, uh, the scripture does provide for uh, those who are to serve as leaders within the church, elders and deacons, and they have particular tasks and responsibilities committed to, their, to them, to their care. They are responsible for the spiritual well-being of the church. And so God sets apart some to serve in this capacity. They are to be servant leaders. That is to say, they are to sacrifice themselves their own interests on behalf of those whom they serve. Their interest is in the work of the gospel, the advance of that gospel, rather than their own advancement uh, or uh, any other thing. So uh, Christ has given to his church a government whereby uh, we are to be uh, led directed, protected. The uh, emphasis here at the opening of this article is on the fact that, that this spiritual government is that which the Lord has taught us in his word. We're not free to arrange the government of the church in the way that we think would be most efficient, most effective, uh, or perhaps more convenient. Uh, in the broader church today, you see a wide variety of approaches to church government. The Belgian Confession is interacting with the Roman church, which was hierarchical in nature. It was monarchical as well. And so you have individuals holding positions with others underneath them, the Pope and the bishops and the cardinals, or maybe the cardinals and the bishops, and then the priests and so forth. And so they each have their different divisions of responsibility working their way down. You see that reflected in the Episcopal Church that has a similar, uh, not identical, but a similar arrangement, a monarchical form of church government. Uh, 
then you have the more uh, Anabaptist churches that uh, have a, a government that may be monarchical in terms of one particular pastor ruling the church, and everybody does what that pastor wants to do, and so he's kind of a pope of the local church. Or you might have a session working within that local church, but very little in the way of a connection with other churches. Each church is rather independent. Uh, the Presbyterian form of government is different from all of these, in that first, the government is uh, not monarchical, but is, if you will, collegial. Uh, it is arranged in such a way that you have pastors and elders or a plurality of leaders within the local congregation. And it is that plurality that makes decisions over different issues that uh, arise within the life of the church. So you are not simply limited to the perspectives, ideas, prejudices, biases of the pastor or one particular ruling elder, but you hopefully have the input of uh, others who will help to shape the, the direction of the church. So the Presbyterian form of government is not monarchical, it is collegial in style. Further, the Presbyterian form of government is hierarchical. There are different levels of church government within a Presbyterian church. So we are a connected church. We are connected with other Presbyterian churches. So we are part, in our local church, part of a larger Presbytery of churches. Churches gathered in this region of the country that bind themselves together to form a presbytery, and the government of these churches is then overseen by the presbytery, which is composed of representatives of each congregation, pastors and elders. And then within the presbyterian system, you have, you have a national church government, and in our approach it is the general assembly. And all the presbyteries across the country, we have, what, 13 presbyteries or so, uh, send representatives to the General Assembly, which meets once a year, and they conduct the business for the whole church. They make decisions on things that arise from the sessions to the presbyteries and from presbyteries into the General Assembly. And so the goal of the Presbyterian Church will be to counter uh, the various prejudices of individuals, to restrain evil, and to promote the good within the church, the purity peace, purity, and unity of the church. We believe this is given to us in the scriptures. It comes out of the word of God. And the Belgian Confession points to this, that we, we have this given to us in scripture. In the book of Acts, Paul appoints elders, a plurality of elders in each local congregation. Remember at Ephesus, he gathers with the elders at Miletus, and there's a group of them there, and they meet together for one last final exhortation and conversation. You have Paul writing to the church at Philippi addressing the elders and deacons who are there within the church. And so there is this plurality of leadership within each local church, and that is something that we ought to be looking for. The confession says that there should be ministers or pastors to preach the word of God and administer the sacraments. Again, this is the, the primary principle role of, of the elders, and particularly the pastor, to devote themselves to the ministry of the Word of God and the administration of the sacraments. Uh, this is our primary calling and responsibility. So uh, if you have a church that minimizes the preaching of the Word of God, that kind of pushes it to the side in favor of lots of music or perhaps other forms of uh, experiences, dramas, plays, testimonies, all these kinds of things, and the preaching of the word becomes secondary and minimal and uh, very superficial, um, I don't think that that will contribute to a very healthy church. There should be ministers who preach the word of God and minister the sacraments. Also, elders and deacons. Now, here you see the Dutch Reformed tradition of a council where elders and deacons meet together. Um, in our churches, elders and deacons meet separately. The deacons serve uh, under the oversight of the elders, uh, but they have their own unique ministry that they are to be engaged in, ministering to the poor, the needs of uh, those who are in need. And so, some slight differences there. The 
confession concludes that by these means everything will be done well and in good order. We Presbyterians uh, tend to smile when we hear the words be, everything being done decently and in good order. Um, we do prefer a service that is well ordered and structured uh, that uh, um, emphasizes the centrality of, of the scriptures uh, in worship. And so that is something that we are very concerned about. We don't have a very loose uh, worship service like you might have in a Quaker meeting when everyone sits down and waits until someone is, that is were moved by the Spirit to share something that they feel they're being led to. Or perhaps in a Pentecostal uh, worship service where a variety of people might want to speak in tongues or somebody else pop up with a prophecy or something like that. Now we believe that things should be done decently and in order and so we have an arrangement for our worship services and we follow that arrangement to structure our understanding of Christ and His Word and to enable us to worship Him together uh, with freedom, uh, with joy, and 